All right, so uh, we're going to go over, and the answers will be provided by the girl with the blue water bottle who is wetting her whistle. Yes, okay, that'll work too. All right, what are they? Give me a quick, quick read. D, A, B. All right, D, all right. All right. Um, so of the first couple questions here, I want to make a blanket statement. No, you do not need to know gamma is higher than infrared is higher than radio. You don't need to know the order, all right? You don't need to know uh, that red is lower energy than purple. You don't need to know that. But if I give you wavelengths, if I say the wavelength of purple is actually, hey, um, uh, Luke, can you look at the spectrum back there behind you on the wall and tell me what a color for pur wavelength for purple would be and then a wavelength for red? Get up, walk over there. <laughs> Let me pause this. So for red, I mean, so for purple, it said 390 nanometers. And for red, what does it say again? 700? 760 nanometers. So these are the wavelengths for these two uh, wavelengths of light. Which one is shorter? 390 to purple. So that means that the distance between one wavelength or photon and the distance to, to the next one, I mean, the distance between each photon is 390 90 nanometers, which is ridiculously tiny amount, right? That's 3.9 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. That's ridiculously tiny. And then red is bigger. It's actually twice as big. But twice as big, ridiculously tiny, is still ridiculously tiny. But it's a longer wavelength. So what does that mean? That means with red, you get fewer waves per second. And therefore, you're being bombarded with less energy. Because it would be like photon, photon. Photon versus photon, 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 photon. That's exaggerating it, right? In reality, it would be like photon, like thousands of them per second, because they're moving at the speed of light, so each photon is so close together. Otherwise, the world would look like a strobe light, right? It'd be like, there was a photon, there was a photon, there was a photon. But, um, so if you're given wavelengths of light, or if you're given frequencies, frequencies would be the inverse, right? If the frequency is high, the wavelength is short. And usually people say long and short for wavelength and high and low for frequency, right? Those are the common adjectives to describe them. So uh, the energy of a photon of light is directly proportional to its frequency. If you have high frequency, the energy would be high. You'd be getting lots of bombardments per second. Um, proportion, inversely proportional to its wavelength, the wavelength should be short because the distance between collisions is more common, is, is shorter. Did that answer that idea? It also kind of delves down into this one, this one, <laughs> this one. All of those are all about wavelengths and you really need to be supplied wavelengths. I'm not going to ask you to do math though, but if you feel like doing math, feel free to pick up your equation sheet and say, hey, look, E equals H nu, or C equals lambda times nu, and do math that you don't need to do. You can probably just do logic. You can probably do the frequency is higher, the energy would be higher, right? And not actually type anything into a calculator. Um, if you feel that you need to, feel free to, but you shouldn't need to. Number 14 throws a lot of people off. Of the following transitions for a Bohr atom from blank to blank transition, this would emit the highest energy. Uh, the highest energy level is six of any of these choices. So that would be, here's the proton, the nucleus, one, two, three, four, five, six energy levels out. And it would be going into one, releasing more energy than any of the other scenarios. Many of the others, are actually absorption. Which one is an absorption answer? 
D is an absorption answer. It's going from lower to higher. A, yep, and E. All four of three of those are absorbing energy. The electron's getting bumped up to a higher energy level or to a higher energy level. And that would mean that a photon of light is coming in and giving that, that electron a high five. Ooh, that sounded like it hurt. A high five and going up to a higher energy level. In order to come back down, it's got to release a photon. This one is also emission, but not as much as being emitted. Does that make sense? Next page, and the answers are... Coolio and the gang. All right, any issues on this one at all before I just ramble? Tw 27. A hydrogen atom and electron in the blank orbital can absorb a photon but cannot emit a photon. That is, yeah, that one's, that one's D, yeah. That's the one that throws people off the most. Um, it's a shame I circled the wrong answer. It is D. Did I have the wrong answer on the answer sheet? Yeah, that's the one I have wrong. Sorry. I have one wrong answer. It's totally her fault. Um, so why is it D? Uh, if it's in the 1s orbital, can it go down any further? No. So it can't emit electrons, but it certainly can absorb the... Uh, Sorry, it can't emit photons, my bad, but it could absorb photons and be kicked up to a higher energy level. What, what? How do you get number 20? There are blank orbitals in the third energy shell or third energy level. So on the first energy level, there's an S. On the second energy level, there's 2S, 2P, 6 which would be one orbital and then three orbitals for a total of four orbitals. Um, and then on the third energy level, there's 3s. That pause brought to you by allergies. Um, I know I just wrote them out of order, right? But these are all on the third energy level. SPD, 1, 3, 5, 5 plus 3 plus 1 is 9. So there's 9 orbitals on the third energy level potentially being used. Potentially. Good, good emphasis. All right. Uh, any more questions on here? Yes, you in the striped shirt. Say again. Sublevel, subshell is the same idea. Um, so when we say sublevel, so you take the energy level, say the third energy level, and you break it apart into three sublevels. There's an S sublevel or subshell, a P, and a D. And then you can further subdivide those into orbitals, right? Which are the locations we expect to find up to two electrons with opposite spin. Um, there's two different sets of vocabulary used out there. People say level, level, level. Other people say shell, shell, shell. So there's energy levels, energy shells, right? It's all a shell game. It's just being shifted around. All right, next page. Moving pretty well. Um, a, D, A, C. Ooh, we finally have the term shielding here. That's one that you have to, have to, have to, have to, have to, have to know. Um, Let's draw like an old school picture. There's a phosphorus atom with a nucleus. And then it has the 1s, it has the 2s and the 2p, it has the 3s and the 3p. The 3p would be just barely farther away than the 3s. Just barely. Almost the same. Like, almost no difference on the graph. Uh, but it would be slightly more shielded. What are they shielded by? This level all right, is being pushed away by these two levels from the nucleus. These two levels are pushing that level away from the nucleus 
and that repulsion by the energy levels is called shielding. They're like shielding their access to the nucleus. Like that time that Alex tried to go like hang out with One Direction, but the bouncers stopped him from getting in there, right? That yeah, was pretty cool, except for the bruises. I mean, um, any issues on 28, 29, or 30? Each P subshell can accommodate a maximum of, so the P's have three orbitals. Each one can hold two electrons. Ah, no, it's the whole thing. This would be, there's three orbitals on the P sublevel or subshell. Yeah. All right. Next page. And the answers are. What? B. All right. I think there's a fun one on here that lots of people, not a funion, no, a fun one in here that a lot of people have questions about, but we'll see. Donde estas? Donde estas? Where are you? No. Do you have any questions? I'll just try English. Barely my first language. What the heck is that NS1 thing? What does the N stand for? Energy level, right. So 3S1 or 2S1 or 4S1. All of the S1s are in the same column. We call that column the alkali metals. That group, I guess I should say. What is a principal quantum number? That would be the energy level again. It's another term for energy level. It wouldn't be chemistry if we didn't have five terms that mean the exact same thing, right? We have lots of, what do you call those? Two words that mean the same thing. Synonym. I thought I heard someone say cinnamon, and I was like, that is not the right word. I heard seba seba seba. Consonant? Consonant's like a hard letter. Yes, I agree. Me neither. That's why I had to ask. Uh, do you know what the chalcogens are? It's not like a made up word. That's the carbon family. That's like the uber dorky name for the carbon family. No one ever uses, except for chemists. Hey, Mr. Murphy. Oh, never mind. That's pretty easy. Should we go to the next page? All right. Uh, I need the answers. Okay, a couple of common things in here. Oh, is if you circle the wrong answer, you get it wrong. Now, um, so we don't usually use the A system anymore. I think, what's your periodic table say above them? Does it say anything? Is it numbered one through 18? Okay, good. There, there used to be a common AB system where the, where the element, actually this one doesn't follow that. This is a different system. There's been like four different systems for naming the columns. And now we've just gone one to 18. But there used to be like a, these and these were the A zone, and then this was the B zone, and then we ditched that, and there was another thing, and there was another thing. And so you occasionally see like professors that have that still hiding in the background because they still subscribe to what they learned in 1945, you know, and they're ancient and they're still teaching. Um, some of the books have been updated, some of the books haven't. They should all be following the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistries format. IUPAC rules chemistry. Um, but so 8A would be usually would be group 18. So anyway. Um, don't worry about the A's. That's not something I'm going to ask you. How many of you guys have questions about 48? Only three? All right. Well, I like those three people a lot. So I'll go with that. So uh, this is the idea here. Oh, look at that. That's a beautiful 
three-dimensional axis, right? Which axis is this p orbital on? Oh, you're wrong, but okay. Which axis is this one on? And this one? Okay. Now you're right. Um, and so what people would do is they would label them PY, PX, PZ. Can hold two, can hold two, can hold two. And they would break them apart into the three. And then the X denoted which axis it was on. Does that make sense? So there are other ways of writing configurations we're never going to do. Where you'd go 1S2, 2S2, 2PX2, 2PY2, 2PZ2, 3S2, 3PX. You get the idea? So you'd have a notation for each orbital along the way. What the heck would you do with the D's then? Because there's five orbitals. And what are the what, huh? Um, first, the three of the five orbitals are between the axis. Um, so actually, I, brought, I have these models up here for this purpose. The stick that goes up and down and right and left is like the x, y. This is the orbital that's between them. This is one orbital for the D. That looks like four shapes. It's one shape. <laughs> it's one shape. And that's the D, y. That's a, that's a D, x, y. Because they're between which axis? What would this one be? The YZ, because they're between the YZ. What would this one be? XZ. And then there's one that's actually on the axis, and I'm just going to cheat and turn this this way. Actually, it's on, like this way. It's on, it's on the X, Y, XZ, whatever. And then there's one more that goes up and down on the axis, and that's this one. And this one has like a weird like DX squared Y squared name. We don't use those, but you might see them in documents. You might see them on the internet if you ever go there. It's a pretty exciting place. Um, and then you get the weird donut shape. All of these things are math. Um, this is not something like a, a microscope observed. There's a guy or girl. Let's, let's say Mackenzie. Mackenzie does really cool math. She draws circles with equations. Have you ever drawn circles with equations? Right. You do like like you were given values and it makes a circle. Given other values, maybe it makes an ellipse, right? If you're given enough data, you make one of these. A three-dimensional shape that looks like so painful you want to like poke your eye out, right? Um, this is one equation. This is one equation. This is one equation. This is one equation. That's one equation. They're all different single equations. Um, we don't do the math. That's one of the things you need to say a prayer for tonight. Um, <laughs> but it is out there. It is out there. You in the back with the tie-dye shirt. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't hear that. It was a really important question. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, that was funny, too. Now they're sitting at home going, oh, is that key? Do I need to know that? Just ask Luke. He'll tell you. All right. Any of the other ones you have questions about? Hey, Mr. Murphy? Yeah. 55. What the flip? That D. Why is that there? Um, what you typically do after you write them, Aufbau's order is the order in which they build up. Right? But then after you've built them up, a lot of times they get put in order via distance from the nucleus. So that 3P, that 3D6... That's not farther away than the 4s2. It's on the third energy level. It just fills up after the 4s2. So quite often people write them and then they, they go, okay, but in reality, the 4s is outside of, farther from the nucleus than the 3d, so it should be last. The other purpose for that is it makes it more prominent that the 4s is the valence shell. It's on the outside of the nucleus which is why iron is usually a plus two charge because its valence shell has how many electrons? Two. It's also often a plus three because it will lose one of those Ds and then every D orbital will be half filled instead of even, yes, you. What's uh, Yeah, Yeah, Oh, 
she is right. Or my German speaking friend is right. Um, yes, 54 should be D, all of the above. The 2px, that's a specific orbital. It can only hold two electrons. The 4dxy, that is the orbital in the D that's on the xy. And the 3s, which I just obliterated, um, also can only hold one. So any one of those could hold only two electrons. Good point. Uh, uh, Guten Tag. No, that's not. That's, never mind. Guten what? Gut gemacht. All right, I need to learn this stuff. All right, let's go to the next page. Ah, I don't need to know the answers for this one. I could do this one in my head. Um, uh, poly, poly is all about the opposite spin, right? That's good. That's a happy poly. Same spin is an unhappy poly. These guys are not allowed. Has to be the same opposite spin, not the same spin. Yeah, I know, I just made them look like sad faces and happy faces. Yeah, like really angry, like intense eyebrows on that one. So which one violates the poly exclusion principle? C does, right there. I'm pointing with this stick. You can't see the stick. Uh, right here, I need the wand. They have a Promethean wand pen. It's like, it's like two feet long. You can like hold it and it looks like you're like Harry Potter, like Wingardium Leviosa. And you get the, anyway. um, hey, let's look at the others. There's other things going on. This is a poly exclusion principle violation. Uh, what type of violation is A other than against humanity? Huns. It's a Huns rule violation. It's a good thing there's no like speaking version of the AP Chem test. All right, come up here and say these names correctly. You fail. Um, what is what is B a violation of? Nothing. I tried to trick you. You figured it out. What element would B be? Yeah, lithium. Uh, D is just odd. Like, why did you skip that box? Usually people fill them up left to right. You're an odd writer. Um, by convention, we go left, right, and uh, that's the order we fill them up in. In reality, though, each of those boxes represents an orbit around the nucleus. This is like the PX, maybe. Maybe this is the PY, and that's the PZ. What really determines that the electron go in a specific location? Random chance, right? So to actually say it must be in the PY is, is not true. It's just by standard convention, people go X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, okay? Uh, e, E has also got an oddity to it. I would say it is some sort of excited atom. It is not a ground state configuration. It might be an excited atom where one of the 1s and the 2s's have been hit with photons and kicked up a notch. Um, kicked up a notch so that they are now ions. Because there can't be, the, the, the 1s that's here would be that spin, right? If it was there. Do you see a down spin electron anywhere? So that electron must be gone. A down spin electron cannot flip over and become an up spin electron. They are locked into place until they're destroyed. Um, so it might be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe it's a nitrogen plus two somehow. Like it's lost its 1s and its 2s down spin electrons that they've been removed from the atom. Other than that, the other possibility is this person just doesn't know what they're doing, right? I instead of a nitrogen plus two, it might be a badly drawn boron. Um, boron done me wrong. Uh, if it was boron done correctly, it'd be one, two, three, four, one. Right? What's up? Huh? D and E are options for a weird scenario. Yeah. Yeah. 
that would have to be really thoroughly described ahead of time, wouldn't they? All right, next page. Which one of these is the correct configuration for ground state nitrogen? I know the answer is D. Yay. Um, again, convention says X, y, X, Y, Z, up, up, up. In reality, would you say that they would all have to be up, or is it just happenstance that the ones going in there are up? It's just happenstance, right. The, I, I would argue the probability is the first one's up or down, the second one's up or down, the third one's up or down. Each one's a 50-50 shot going into there. But by convention, chemists decided to go up, 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 down, 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 and just all accept that it could be either way. We're good? So you have to follow the convention. Just like those silly physicists and pretending positive charges are moving through the uh, wires when really the negative charges are moving the other direction. So there's always some sort of like frame of mind we look at it in. Uh, which one's a violation of Hun's rule? Charlie, I think is. We should have spread those two out. Uh, this one's just bad also. It's a slightly excited lithium atom maybe, right? Like the lithium atom is just barely excited. You got went from a 1s to a 2s. It's three electrons. Eh. Um, this one's got a poly exclusion principle violation. This person just isn't following standard conventions. And that one is nitrogen. Yeah, that's the right way to draw nitrogen. And then we have the PES, which I'm going to zoom in on slightly. We're going to have to pause for a minute after this. So uh, this PES is labeled with the 1Ss and the 2Ss, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you should be able to figure out that's the 1S, though. And before I get into why, let me explain what this graph is. So uh, a person, let's call him Andrew or Drew, whichever one, they're pretty much identical, um, is trying to remove electrons from an atom, and it's going to take energy. If she is the nucleus and you all are the energy levels, you four, which of you four is the farthest from the nucleus? All right, everyone looks at the guy in the back. Good job. So you're, you're, you're repelled by these other energy levels, and I'm too. Um, and the nucleus pulls you in, but they repel you. You'd be the easiest to take. So whichever of these values is the lowest energy would represent you. Who is the closest to the nucleus? That guy there in the Penn State sweatshirt. He has how much electron shielding on him? None. So he has direct access to the nucleus, lots of attraction between the two, so it would be the hardest to take him. The 1s is always the highest energy level. It's always the highest, hardest, I mean, hardest to take because it's the closest to the nucleus. It has no shielding. The 1s here for, what is this, argon, 1s here for neon, 1s for helium. Uh, why the drop, though, between these three? What's the difference in the 1s here in the, in the three elements? I see lips moving, but I can't hear the noises coming out of the mouths of the people. Guy in the tie-dye shirt in the back with his hand up in the air. Protons, protons, protons. The effective nuclear charge for argon is greater than for helium. In this scenario, the only thing left is the 1s electrons that we're trying to take. Helium has two protons pulling on two electrons. Neon has 10 protons pulling on two electrons. Argon has 18 protons, that's a large positive charge, pulling on just two electrons. Those electrons would, it would require a lot of energy to remove them. And you can see the huge increase. We go from, what is this, 23 to 870 to 3,206 electron volts per mole. Um, so explain why the energy needed to remove the 1s is greatest in argon. I think we just thoroughly knocked that out of the park. 
drastic increase in effective nuclear charge. Why does it take less energy to remove the 3P? We'll go red. Then it does the 2P. This is a shielding effect. Cross the T. Um, shielding effect response. The 3P6 in argon is shielded by those inner energy levels. It is repelled by the inner energy levels. So the 3P6 would take less energy. Preguntas, estudiantes. Does that make sense? You good? All right. Let me pause to add some more questions to this. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to stop and make a second video before I ruin the first one.